Okay, everybody, welcome. Uh, I think we're going to get started. Thanks to Yossi for hosting. He's really uh, punishing himself by being in Switzerland now um, in very, very difficult weather, cool weather. He may even be skiing for all I know. So Yossi, I don't want to say we're jealous just because it's 97 degrees here. 34 degrees. Well, don't let that bother you. Thank you for hosting and welcome to everybody. We're going to uh, discuss a very, very important Parsha in the Torah today. Maybe in some ways the most important Parsha in the Torah because history changes with Parshat Shlach, Shlach Lecha, if you will. Uh, I usually just call it Shlach. And in in Yiddish, we would say it's uh, Shlechter. Uh, which means weak. It's a weak point in Jewish history, unfortunately. But it nevertheless is a crossroads and something which we've never really overcome. In this Parsha, as we know, the central portion deals with the sin of the Meraglim. Uh, the Meraglim, ostensibly, we'll talk in a moment about that word, Meraglim. Uh, if you will, it can come from the word ragel, to be a spy. They are told to go into the land and check it out. Not so much to decide if we should go there or not, but how exactly we can approach the conquest of Eretz Israel. God has already seven, said, I'm giving the land to you. So that's a done deal. But unfortunately, it's not completely accepted as we'll see, leading to this great tragedy. The major tragedy really in the history of the Jewish people, which I know is saying a mouthful, nevertheless, uh, this is a turning point in Jewish history. We could have run into the land, we could have uh, taken it over, built the Beit HaMikdash, established uh, the government, be it kingdom or otherwise, but it was not to be because the Meraglim lost faith. And we'll talk about exactly why that happened in a moment. But this is a, as I said, a, a crucial turning point in Jewish history. Uh, it results in 600,000 people ultimately dying as a result, although they only die at the age of 60. Nevertheless, uh, the whole generation has to die out in order for a new generation to come up and have a very different attitude towards believing in Hashem and ultimately coming under Yoshua's leadership into the land. Of course, it also results in Moshe Rabbeinu not, being a, not going into the land, of which he's, of course, very, very distraught. And uh, as we'll see later in Parshat Bet Hanan, tries everything possible to ask Hashem to let him in, but it is not to be. So uh, Parshat Shlach uh, is, uh, we have to examine what happened here so that we can learn from it. If we take a look for a bit of a clue, and there are different reasons given by Chazal as to what happened to these individuals who were going to represent the 12 tribes and come back hopefully with the uh, instructions, what is the best way for us to proceed into the land? Not if, but when and how. Now notice by the way, that already here, although the B'nai Israel are living a life of miracles, Every single second that they are in the desert, with all the, the mun, the cloud of fire, uh, every, the water from a well, everything that allows them to survive, and yet they are told, you're going to come into this land, 
in a natural way, not in a miraculous way. Otherwise, God would have just simply made the inhabitants disappear and and uh, the, the Jews walk in uh, unhampered by any problems. But we see that already they're being told that when you in, enter Israel, you're going to have to lead a natural life. You're going to have to fight in order to take over the land. You're going to have to use military strategy, your intelligence. And yes, I will be there with you, but you're we're going to be partners in this endeavor and you're not going to, I'm not going to do it alone. And this uh, is a clue already to what is on the minds of these Muraglim. Now, first of all, the there are 12 Muraglim. Uh, 10 of them are going to deliver this negative conclusion that we cannot go in and conquer the land, even though God said he will be with us and we will do it. Only Kalev and Yoshua will be the odd men out. The other 10 are going to be this, what the Torah calls a dahara'a, this evil congregation. By the way, it is from here that we learn that a minion is made up of 10 people. We learn it from the 10 spies. When I ask this question, sometimes everybody says, and I say, where do we learn it? They answer, well, we learn that because when Abraham argues for Sodom, he stops when there isn't even, there aren't even 10 people. Well, that's not where we learn it from. We actually learn it from here. I don't want to make any comments about why we're talking about an evil congregation as a former rabbi of a congregation. There are many jokes about that. But in any case, the number 10 is learned from here for a minion. All right. So what happened to these people? They are the creme de la creme. Um, these are the not military or even necessarily uh social leaders, these are the spiritual leaders, we are told. What happens to them? Kalev and Yoshua are not even at the top of the list. They're numbers three and five, respectively. And um, there are others who are better than them. And there's a whole discussion about when these people went bad. And the Gemara at some point wants to, first wants to say, they always had the intent to give a negative report about living in Israel and entering Israel. Others say, no, they were good at first. And then they later on, under pressure from the rank and file, the, the people, the populace, that's when they turn bad. It's not clear. But I want to, to notice something. Uh, we are already see, seeing a clue right at the beginning of the Parsha. And listen to the words. So Hashem says to Moshe, Shalach lecha anashim v'yaturot eretz Canaan. You know, send out men and tour the land of Canaan, asher anino tein libnei Israel, which I am giving to the Jewish people. Ish echad, ish echad, one man, one man, l'matei avotav tishlachu, representing the tribes, send them, kol nasi bahem, everyone is a prince. The next Pesach says, Moshe sends them out, Kulam Anashim, Rashi B'nei Yisrael Hema, all men, the heads of the Jewish people. And later on, after we list the names, Eilish Shemot Anashim, these are the names of, of the people, of uh, the Anashim that were sent. And when you look at this in total, you see something that really the Torah is trying to hit us over the head in telling us about the greatness of these people. I mean, look at all the terms we use. First of all, anashim. Whenever it says ish, ish is a very positive terminology. A man, you are a man among men. Um, that stands alone. And then we say ish echad, ish echad. Everyone was singular. That is, there were no schleppers here. Every single one was echad, was unique, and was uh, one of a kind in a sense. 
Kol nasi bahem. They were all princes. And then why does the Torah have to repeat the same thing in the next Pasuk? Kulam anashim. This is not a sexist issue, all men and no women. It's not saying that. They're not going to send women out on a, on a spying mission, uh, which is quite dangerous. So anashim, again, meaning the top-notch people, Rashi B'nai Yisrael Hema, they were the heads. Well, and again, um, as saying it at, at the end as well. So five, six, seven times, we're telling you how great they are. Now, what... Why does the Torah, it's not doing this unless it's sending us a message. And one message could be emphasizing that these are great people, yes, but um, methinks the Torah doth compliment too much. It's over and above. Me'alu No, there's something else that the Torah is hinting at here and that is a clue to why they decided they were going to give a negative appraisal of Israel. And the reasoning that Fazal learned from here, from this overuse of stressing about their greatness, was telling us that it's their greatness that brought them down. They thought to themselves, here in the desert, we are leading a phenomenal life. I mean, think about it. We don't have to work. There is you know, no, we're in the desert. There's no work to do per se. So we get up in the morning. Maybe we say our prayers. Hey, uh, we look outside our tent. There's our breakfast. There's our food. It's come down right at the door of the tent or pretty close by. Um, you know, this... This is better than Walt, for those of us who live in Israel, <laughs> this delivery service. Um, and we don't even have to worry about bad drivers bringing it. It falls straight from heaven. Um, we are protected at night. We have the fire keeps us warm, protects us. We have the cloud during the day, so it shields out all the bad rays. And we're very comfortable. Uh, our clothes, we're told, the cl our clothes grew with them. Um, we have a great leader with us named Moshe. He's teaching us. Wow. You can't get really better than that. And, you know, this is paradise here. But not only is it paradise, they say, but we're at the top of the ladder. We are the great ones. We are the champions. That's maybe that's where that song came from. We are the champions, and you know, we're the leaders, men among men, Ishachad, Ishachad. And well, we get respect, we get this tremendous kavod. We're the heads of our tribes. Why would we want to give that up? Because as they reasoned and understood when we get to Israel, and, uh, and I said just by virtue of the fact that we were not entering Israel miraculously, we were entering with a strategy, a plan, with an army. So they understood from that, hey, everything's going to change when we enter Israel. And this cushy life that we've been leading especially since we're really at the top of, of the heap, it's not going to continue when we get there. There's going to be a whole change that takes place. A, we're, everybody's going to have to work and work very hard. B, uh, presumably there will be a changing of the guard and there'll be new leaders. Maybe there'll even be a more democratic selection. Uh, of who will become leader of the tribes. I mean, uh, kingship royalty is one thing that was an aristocracy, not a meritocracy, but that doesn't mean that all the other positions were just automatically handed, handed to people and who they chose or their next of kin, not necessarily, no. And we see this reflected all the time in the Torah, um, that essentially you do have to earn it. So these people are figuring, 
why would we want to give that up? And that's what I think this overuse of talking about their greatness, it's, it's, it's almost counter complementary. It's because they consider themselves so great that that is what led to their downfall and assuming that somehow we can orchestrate things so that we stay in this bubble forever. But of course, we know that that's not going to happen. And they're not going to survive this because Hashem's plan, although it's going to be delayed, because we as God's partners do not do everything we should, it will not be dismissed. It will be delayed, but it will not be dismissed. It will take 40 years until this generation is gone. I mean, these 10 scouts or spies of Miraglin, uh, they're gone right away. But the rest of the nation that followed them, and by the way, it wasn't everybody. It wasn't obviously Kalev, uh, and it wasn't, uh, or his tribe, or uh, Yoshua, and it wasn't the women. They're smarter than the men, as always. So they didn't go along with it. It wasn't Shevet Levi either. So there were those who did survive and were able to presumably come into the land. But all the others, no, they would be gone. Notice, by the way, this word maraglim. Uh, there are some who want to connect that word to the word ragil. Not so much a spy, but the, the concept of getting used to something. And, you know, the, the, the terminology we use it for today, um, ragil, and um, they were too used to having this, uh, um, hold on one second, somebody just asking me here about the, uh, about the class, I want to tell them they can tune in if they want to, it's not too late, hang on one sec. So they were just, they just got used to it. And it was something that, you know, after you get used to a certain uh, state and position of luxury, you don't really want to give it up. But a lot of that was based upon their own personal ego. The sense of, I like being where I'm at. I like being able to tell others what to do. And I know that when we come into a new land, there's going to be new leadership. And that's not something we want to be a part of. Um, I, I think I've talked about this before, but um, I'll mention it again for those who want to pick up on it and just, just for a moment. Um, there's this great Twilight Zone episode called, you can Google it. Uh, it's called, On Thursday We Leave for Home. Um, and I think you can get it on the internet. It stars James Whitmore, who is a great actor. Again, on Thursday, we leave for home. And uh, just shortly to tell you, it's about um, a colony of Earth people that go to a new planet, and they're going to colonize the planet. But it's a very harsh uh, existence there. It's a planet that has two suns, very difficult uh, you know, to do any kind of work in the daytime. Um, and a whole generation grows up there uh, that was not born on Earth. Uh, but James Whitmore, who is the, the leader of the group, he tells them how wonderful things are on Earth where you have a more moderate temperature, maybe not what we're experiencing in Israel today, but a moderate temperature with one sun, a change of seasons. There's even snow uh, and, and, and chilly weather. And the children are just absolutely uh, enthralled to hear about this. And he even tells them that uh, on earth in America, there is a game called baseball. And uh, he tells all about how it's played. And he says, someday, um, you know, we'll go back to that wonderful, fantastic country uh, and planet. 
and the years go by, and then a message comes that the colony has not really been successful, and they're sending a spaceship to take everybody back to Earth. And uh, people are so excited, the children are very excited, and um, when the day comes, the spaceship lands, and out come the astronauts who are uh, kind of acclimating the people, and they're going to leave in three days to get them ready to go. And they decide to, um, uh, the children say, we hear that there is a game called baseball. And the astronauts say, yes, we even brought some, some equipment, some balls and bats and gloves. And uh, James Whitmore uh, says, no, you can't play. It's too hot. You'll be exhausted. You'll get heat stroke. And the astronauts say, don't worry, we'll take care of them. And he tries to prevent them, uh, but they don't listen to him. And a couple of other things happen where, again, they just kind of dismiss him. Well, when the time comes to leave and they start boarding the ship, so everybody is on board except um, the leader, James Whitmore, and they can't find him. And they keep announcing uh, we're leaving, you know, it's Thursday, we're ready to go back. And, you know, they announce we're leaving in four hours and three hours and two hours. And finally, they say, this is your last chance. If you don't get on board, then you're going to be stuck alone on this planet forever. We're not coming back. And sure enough, he doesn't come on the ship and the, the spaceship leaves. And in the last scene, he's shown he's hiding in a cave. And he's just saying to himself, on Earth, there are changes of season. The earth is beautiful. It's such a great planet. And, you know, it's just very, of course, very, very sad. Uh, but the, the point of the story, of course, is that he did not want to give up his role of leadership. Uh, if that's what it meant, he would stay there, even though he would miss everything. And even though he loved, you know, his reminiscences and his memories of earth. Well, with the Maraglim also, uh, of course, uh, they hadn't come from Israel, but they heard from their ancestors, of course, passed down from Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, how wonderful Israel is. Um, and, and they maybe were, you know, all the time we were in Egypt for 210 years dreaming about going back. But when it comes time to get on the ship, if it means giving up their perks, and their position, they just didn't want to do it. Now, I want to add to this, um, there is another kind of um, what we would call a cautionary tale. And that is after the 10 spies are killed um, and uh, um, the people are told what the punishment is going to be, uh, that they're going to have to stay here for 40 years, well, they decide, um, and I just want to look up this uh, source here. Um, so they decide, okay, we made a mistake. We're going. Let's go. And they climb up this mountain towards Israel. And they and Moshe says, don't do it. It's you, the, the chance, you had the chance. The chance is gone. Um, you didn't want it then. Now God has decreed that he wants us to stay again in the desert, this generation for 40 years. And if you go, God will not be with you. Don't go. Um, it's not going to be successful, but you know, they're called the Ma'apilim. They are defiant, the defiant ones. It was a great movie. In any case, they decide they're going and they are slaughtered unfortunately, by the Kananim, the Amalekim, who are who see what's happening. They take advantage of the situation and they slaughter these people. This is later to be known, this place as the Valley of the Dry Bones, when Yechezkel says, will these bones rise again? These people who said, we're going to kind of push the envelope and come anyway, even though it was not with God's blessing. And um, it's also very sad for people uh, who have the chance but miss out on it and they don't take advantage of the opportunity. And when they finally get the message and they finally realize this is what we should be doing, it's too late for them. 
Um, and of course, for us, this is very, very reminiscent of what happened during the Shoah, when there were such desperate attempts uh, by emissaries from Israel to get the Jews out of Europe um, and get them uh, somehow to Israel, maybe because of the, the British blockading uh, the waters through the white, because of the white paper, the infamous white paper <clears throat> of 1939, maybe they, you know, would have to go first uh, to Cyprus or they'd have to sneak in, but they would at least be, be alive. And um, unfortunately, only a very small, tiny percentage of the people listened and came. And by the time they realized that we need to get out of here, it was too late. And by that time, there was just um, no, no way they could, they, could, they could get there and no way they could get out. The, the gates had come down, the walls had been put up, the ghettos had been created, and it was almost impossible to get out of here. So um, the, it's kind of a, 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 of a double um, symbolism and a double whammy here. First, that you know they don't listen and have faith and say, if God told us that we can make it in Israel, we can make it, and we don't have to. We can't question God. It was never our place to make a decision if we should go or not. The decision was made how to go and what's the best strategy for coming into the land. It wasn't, we overstepped our boundaries and that was the first tragedy. And then when others, uh, several thousand from the population said, all right, we made a mistake. We shouldn't have followed them, but now we want to correct it. It doesn't always work that way. Um, and so, although tshuva is always possible, um, nevertheless, there are situations when the train has left the station, you, you simply can't get on it. And so it's a, it's a very, in a sense, tragic Parsha, but I'll close with the fact that in the same Parsha, we talk about certain things like Chala, the taking of Chala, which a portion is given to the Kohanim. And we talk about the, the offerings, especially the libations, uh, that the 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 wine uh, as an oil uh yain lanesach you know to be used for sacramental purposes so that's put into this parsha that's god's way of saying eventually the nation of israel uh is going to get to israel okay it's this generation may die out most of it but ultimately, the nation as a nation will enter Israel. You will build the Beit HaMikdash. You will accomplish all the things that says Hashem that I, I said you were going to accomplish. And you'll be able to bring these offerings. It's maybe almost, you know, uh, kind of cruel to tell the people who are now stuck in the desert to tell them that these things will happen, but they won't be there. But it's God's way of assuring and reassuring the nation that Am Yisrael is eternal. Um, it's going to pursue its history, and it may take a long time because we don't always jump on the train. Maybe for 2,000 years, we waited to jump on the train. And then even when Herzl came along, there were people who wouldn't get on the train and still won't get on the train. But the train is going to end up where Hashem says it will. And it's going to continue on its path. And those who are smart enough and faithful enough and loyal enough, they're going to be on that train. It didn't happen for a lot of the people and in this Parsha, uh, and certainly for the 10 spies who went against Hashem. But it has, in our generation, we have boarded that train again, and we are headed even though it's a dangerous route and we're going through a lot of dangerous territory, nevertheless, that train will continue until we get to where we're going because Hashem promises so. And Am Yisrael, uh, lo, um, lo Yishaker, Netzach Yisrael, Lo Yishaker, 
the eternity of the Jewish people and of Israel can never be false. So a uh, lot to digest here and um, something to think about because this is a very, very relevant Parsha to what's going on in the world today. And I'll let you draw your own conclusions. Uh, there are a lot of uh, things we can say about it. So uh, I thank you for tuning in. I hope that uh, we'll hear, start to hear good news every day. Uh, unfortunately, another uh, soldier who we lost today and all we can do is pray to Hashem that uh, we are going ultimately to, to go in the right direction and Hashem is going to release, help to release, help us to release the hostages and of course that our soldiers will be safe and the wounded will heal. Thank you all. Shabbat Shalom. Besorot Tobot.